said, we're in the middle of this series uh, called Kingdom Come. And we're basically talking about what it means to bring God's kingdom here to earth. And we've said since the beginning of this series that a kingdom is simply anywhere that the king's will is done. It's the king's domain. And we used to have this mantra here at Access that we would say that we like to bring up there, down here. And that basically means that as Christians, as God's agents of change, we wanted to bring his kingdom, what was going on in heaven here to earth. And so sometimes we only think about heaven, we only think about heaven in terms of the afterlife. Like heaven is a place that we will go when we die. But as Christians, heaven wasn't just meant to be a place that we go, it was meant to be a thing that we take everywhere that we go. And so that's what this series has been about. We're looking at what it means to bring God's kingdom to earth. And see what happens when we think about heaven only in terms of the afterlife is that we switch our destiny with our assignment. See, our destiny is that ultimately one day we will end up in heaven, but our assignment is to bring heaven to earth. And that's what we're supposed to be focused on while we are here, is bringing heaven down to earth. And in the United States, we don't hear that much talk about kingdoms because we don't have a monarchy, we don't have kings, we don't have queens. But the closest thing that we have is the president of the United States. And I don't know if you remember this, some of you may have missed it, but just a few months ago, we had an election. Yep. And, and we had one president and it changed to another president. And no matter what you think of politics, no matter what you think about what happened this season, I have always been fascinated with the political process. I have always been fascinated with the way that elections are won and the way they are lost. I've always been fascinated with the transfer of power. And so I don't know about you, but I find myself during these seasons, like glued to the TV and not like the news as much as like the history channel, where they'll spend like two hours talking about like the presidential limo or two hours talking about Air Force One. And they'll talk about different presidents and different events that have affected how those things operate. That stuff is completely fascinating to me. And I thought I had seen it all, but this year I found out something that I did not know before this year. I found out that the White House, the White House stays completely the same as the incumbent president had it, decorations, furniture, clothes, pictures. It stays completely the same all the way up till election day, all the way until the moment that the new, the president elect arrives and they leave for the inauguration, at which point a team of like unbelievably highly motivated, highly organized people rushes into the White House and in the matter of just a few hours, they completely transform it. And we're talking about, we're not just talking about a few things here and there, we're talking about paint colors, we're talking about ripping up carpets, we're talking about changing out pictures and drapes. And in the matter of hours, they change it over from what one president had to what the new president will have so that as the, the incumbent president leaves, he still feels completely at home, but when the new president comes in, he also feels completely at home. And that is mind blowing to me because I can't even clean my house in five hours. <laughs> I, I have moved before. And the idea of reducing that process into like five hours from beginning to end is incomprehensible. I don't know how they do it. And then you add in the fact that all of these people and all of these items that they're bringing into this house have to go through rigorous security. It seems impossible. And while it's unbelievable, it's not all that surprising. Because as a culture, when we're talking about royalty, when we're talking about people of authority, when we talk about presidents and kings, it's kind of understood that we would never want these people to feel displaced. We couldn't honestly expect an outgoing president to spend his last few weeks in office in some sort of construction zone where he can't find his socks and his suit and his tie. But we also likewise couldn't expect a new president to come in to that environment. And so they make it happen because it's understood that when there's a person of authority, when there's a person that is royal, that we will prepare a place for that person. And we talk about God, the King of Kings, we have to think in the same terms of how we will prepare a place for him. But the place that we prepare for him is not a house, it's not a sanctuary, it's not a building, it's certainly not a Tarzan set. No, the Bible says that God doesn't dwell in houses built by hands. It says that God dwells in the human heart. 
And so the place that we prepare for God is our own heart. It's ourselves, it's you and it's me. And the way that we do it is we do it through worship. We do it through worship. Worship is a way of bringing up there, down here, as it were. But see, we often think of worship as something that happens for 25 minutes or so on a Sunday morning while the band plays. But the problem with that is, if worship is reduced simply to music, then every person who doesn't feel like they can sing or clap or play an instrument suddenly has an out of why they don't participate in worship. Well, I'm not really into worship because I'm not musical. I'm not... I, I can't sing. I can't even clap on beat. No, worship was meant to be a lifestyle. Worship is meant to be in the mundane and seemingly insignificant moments of our day. In fact, the Bible says, whether you eat or drink to do it unto the glory of God. And some of you are like, yeah, I can eat to the glory of God. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm into that. I take that one. But that means when you're making breakfast, that means when you're preparing your kids for school, that means when you're preparing that report, when you're interacting with your coworkers or your spouse, that those moments are meant to be worship and are meant to be given unto the glory of God. See, everyone worships something. It's just a matter of what you worship. Everyone worships something. Some people worship their family. Some people worship their possessions. Some people, if we're really honest, they worship themselves. We all worship. But I think that we can learn a lot about how we are supposed to worship through two encounters that Jesus had with two different women in the Bible. If you'll turn with me to John chapter four, verse one. And I'm gonna read chapter, or I'm gonna read verses one all the way through 24. It'll be on the screen or you can follow along. It says, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go to Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down at the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. That's an understatement. Jews do not associate with Samaritans. In fact, these two people groups hated each other. They would never be seen speaking to each other. And in this culture, much less would a Jewish man be seen speaking to a Samaritan woman. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Oh, snap. <laughs> sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we met must worship is in Jerusalem. Now notice what she just did. Jesus is talking about her and she says, oh, oh, I noticed you're a prophet and asked him a question. So there's a little deflection there. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Now, notice what Jesus says here. He says that he's looking for people who worship him in spirit and in truth. And you notice before he called this woman to worship, he kind of called her out on all of her stuff. 
He told her about her issues. He told her about her current uh, marital situation, her current relational situation. And so like I said, she kind, of, she kind of deflected that. But Jesus tells this woman the truth about her life situation, but then he calls her to come and worship him. See, we can't let the truth of who we are stop us from worshiping God. God already knows the truth about you, so you can't let the truth about who you are stop you from entering into his presence and worshiping him. And Jesus uses a very important word here that we don't always distinguish when we read this chapter or this story. Jesus says that he's looking for worshipers. Now, a lot of times we use this to say that God is looking for worship, but that's not what it says. It says God is looking for worshipers. God is looking for people. Now imagine this with me for a minute, that the God of the universe, the God who the Bible and Revelation describes as sitting on a throne surrounded by angels and saints who sing holy, holy is his name, 24 seven, never stops, never ending praise. That God is looking for something from you and from me. And he's looking for us to become worshipers. Why? Why does he need us to be worshipers? Because see, when we are on earth, he's receiving the praise and the worship of the angels and the saints in heaven. But see, worship from us on earth is different because here on earth is the only place that we can worship God in the hurting, in the unknown, in the uncertainty. See, when we get to heaven, there will be no tears, there will be no pain, there will be no sorrow. But on earth, we can choose to worship him in spite of our circumstances, in spite of our pain, in spite of our sorrow. And why would God say that he's looking for worshipers? Because everything that God does is motivated by love and love always wants what's best. And the best thing that God could want for you is to become like him. And we always become like what we worship. We always become like what we worship. See, some people hear that God is looking for worshipers and what they envision is some egotistical God that sits on his throne and is just starving for affirmation. But in actuality, God's desire for you to become a worshiper is about what it does to you. God's desire for you to become a worshiper is about the fact that when you see him, you will become like him. And he could want nothing less and nothing more than for you to be like him. And it was with that in mind that he designed us to be worshipers. And so likewise, if God wants worship to be the thing that makes us like him, we have to understand that the other side of that coin is that one of the enemy's greatest tools would be to disconnect you from worship. Because if he can disconnect you from worshiping God, he can disconnect you from becoming like him. He can disconnect you from your identity. You were created to be a worshiper. You can't fully fulfill your assignment to bring the kingdom of God to earth without embracing fully a lifestyle of worship. But what does that look like? What does a lifestyle of worship look like? If you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, again, this is a moment that Jesus encounters with a woman and it says this, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was so distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Now I've heard this because I have two daughters and sometimes I tell them to clean their room and for a while you'll hear noises in there that sound something like cleaning. And then all of a sudden one of them will come walking out and they'll say, dad, Sophia's not helping me or Bella's not helping me. Will you tell her to help me? This argument between sisters has continued through the ages. <laughs> and Jesus says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Several years ago, uh, the president at the time, Barack Obama and his wife, Michelle, they went to visit the Queen of England. And that's a very intense situation. 
Because apparently there's a lot of protocol and there's a lot that goes into how you act around the King of England, even if you are the president of the United States. And so from what I understand, they had been briefed on all of this different protocol. In fact, there's all these different rules, like you don't shake the queen's hand, you don't initiate a handshake. In fact, you don't, you don't contact the queen in any physical manner other than a handshake, and only if she initiates the handshake. And listen to this, once she initiates the handshake, then you are just supposed to grasp her hand, but you don't shake, she shakes. There's rule after rule after rule And so they went along with this meeting and apparently everything was going fine. And if you watch the video of this, at one point, the queen puts her hand on Michelle Obama's back to say something. And in a very natural human response, Michelle Obama puts her hand on the queen's back to lean in and listen. And you can hear in the room, the shutters of the cameras going off. Like what has just happened? Well, apparently she initiated contact. There was not a handshake. And that's a mistake. In this moment, that became a news story that she had simply placed her hand on the back of royalty. And so I can only imagine that all of these rules and all of this etiquette that's running through your head completely robs this moment. I mean, she's meeting the queen of England. That should be a big moment in your life. But I imagine that it was completely robbed by that voice in your head. You know, the one when you're trying to follow all the rules and you're just running through all the different things. Okay, do I initiate the handshake or does she initiate the handshake? Does she go 90 and then I go 10? Once she shakes, do I squeeze and do I not? And you're going through all of these things and it completely robs the moment of any human interaction. And I can only imagine that this is sort of what Martha was going through. I mean, the Messiah was coming to her house and rightfully so, she wanted everything to be perfect. She wanted the house to be in order. And so she's cleaning and she's cleaning and she's got this list of things to do and just sitting at the feet of Jesus was not on it. We sing that song, uh, your praise will ever be on my lips. And my youngest daughter used to sing a version that I think Martha could have sang in this moment, which was, your praise will never be on my list. It's like Martha had this list and taking some time to worship God was not on it. We've got two sisters, one gets it and one misses the point. Again, I have been there. Just a few months ago, I was sitting at a stoplight and a little context for this. I have an older daughter, Bella, who is seven, six, and I have a younger daughter, Bella. Uh, so they're, oh my gosh, I know my kids. <laughs> One's about to turn seven, one just turned four. They're six and four, I promise. And we were sitting at a stoplight and for some context, my youngest daughter, Sophia, she sucks these two fingers. So we joke that when she talks, we joke that she's like a mobster because it looks like she's smoking because <laughs> Whenever she wants to say something, she pulls her fingers out, but she just holds them right here. <laughs> and then whenever she's done, she puts them back in. So she'll be like, I need a snack. <laughs> so we're sitting at a stoplight and there's a man holding a sign. He's obviously homeless and he's holding a sign that says hungry. That's all it says. And my six-year-old Bella She goes, dad, dad, that guy's holding a sign that says hungry. And I have an unopened bag of popcorn. Can we give it to him? And I was like, oh, I'm a great parent. This is awesome. (laughs) So I roll down her window. She hands the guy the popcorn. I roll the window back up. And we're just relishing in this moment. Like sometimes things just happen as a parent that you're like, oh, I'm not totally messing these children up. (laughs) They're thinking about others. This is great. And so I'm trying to think about what to say. And I say, Bella, that was really sweet. You know, he, he obviously, he was hungry and you gave him popcorn. I think he needed that. And Sophia goes, he probably needed popcorn because he's going to the movies. <laughs> Just ruined the moment. <laughs> totally didn't get it. And that's what we have going on here. Mary is in this moment where she's doing the right thing just by instinct. And Martha completely misses the boat because of her busyness. That moment is robbed of any human connection. 
of any emotion, of any listening. See, for Mary, it was a very intimate moment as she sits at the feet of Jesus and listens. But for Martha, she was focused on so many things and so busy that the moment was not human. The moment was not intimate because, see, you cannot be busy and intimate at the same time. Intimacy requires slowing down. Intimacy requires listening. And so Martha says to Jesus, please tell her to do something. And Jesus says in that moment, Martha, Mary is doing the one thing. You are doing many things, but Mary is doing the one thing that needs to happen. We're so used to people saying like, don't just sit there, do something. And it's as though Jesus is saying, don't just do something, sit there. It's like the exact opposite of what we are used to hearing. And how many times do we miss moments because of our busyness, because of our preparation, because our mind is not in the right place, that we miss the one thing that is supposed to happen. See, approaching an earthly king, approaching an earthly monarch is, is similar to what I described a moment ago. It's all about perfection. But approaching Jesus, the king of kings, is about posture. Mary chose to sit at his feet. Mary chose to bow herself at his feet and to do the one thing. And we all need to become more like him. And so to do that, we must take on a posture of surrender. We must take on a posture of sitting at his feet and really listening and hearing his words and seeing him for who he is. Because when we see him, that is when we become like him. But how many times do we get lost in the busyness? How many times do we miss these moments that seem mundane, they seem insignificant, and yet if we would just enter them and see them for what they were, we would realize that we could turn those moments into moments of worship, into moments where we hear the voice of Jesus. And I've actually told this story here before, but I think it's worth telling again that a few years ago I was at a conference and it was this conference that was like a missions conference. And they would have leaders from different areas of the world get up and they would kind of give us a brief of what was going on in their area of the world through this missions organization. And so people from Russia would get up and talk about what God is doing in Russia and all over the world. And there was this one guy from China and he got up and he gave his whole brief, he gave his whole story and all that kind of stuff. And I actually noticed while he was speaking that he was holding a handheld mic and I noticed that he kept kind of looking down at it. Like, it, you know, usually when you speak in a mic, it's just not there. It's not something you pay attention to. But he was really paying attention to it. And so he went through this whole thing where he told us what was going on in China and what God was doing and how the church was persecuted over there and all these different things. And then when he got to the end of it, they kind of thanked him and they clapped and he didn't leave and he just stood there. And he turned to the guy who was moderating this talk and he said, could I, could I use this mic for a minute? Which is a weird question because he was using it right then. And the guy said, well, sure, I, sure. And the guy said, see, where I'm from, when we have church, what we do is we gather in our home and we look at pieces of paper that have lyrics to songs on them and we mouth the words to them, but we don't actually say anything out loud because people patrol the streets to make sure that we're not having church. And if they hear us having church, we could be imprisoned, we could be fined. And so we just stick to holding pieces of paper and, and mouthing the words. And he said, I, I've never been in an environment like this where I could use something like this and I could praise God as loud as I wanted to. And so he literally just began to sing. It was really more like talking. And he was just like, God, I praise you, I worship you, I magnify you. And tears start streaming from his face. And it, by the end of it, he's literally just screaming into this microphone and he's down on his knees. He places the mic on the ground and he's just kind of screaming into it these praises to God. 
And let me tell you, to this day, it's one of the most powerful moments in the presence of God I've ever experienced. Because he, like a modern day Mary, stepped into a moment and saw it for what it was. I mean, how many of us would have the courage to do something like that? How many of us would have the courage to honestly look quite foolish? To honestly have people question, what, what is he doing? doing? Doesn't he know how he looks? But see, this guy knew what it meant to not be able to worship. This guy knew what it meant to not be able to lift his voice. This guy knew what it meant. See, we don't have any comparison here in the United States. There's no time where we come together and we worship and we fear that it's going to be too loud because if it is, people are going to burst in the back doors and that we could be separated from our family, from our lives, all because of worship. But this guy knew. And so he entered into a moment and he took advantage of it. And that's exactly what you and I need to do in the everyday moments of our lives, to realize the privilege that we have to worship him, to live lifestyles of worship. Because see, there is worship going on nonstop in heaven. And we can't talk about God's kingdom coming to earth. We can't happen about, talk about what happens up there happening down here, unless we're willing to live lives of surrender and to live lives of worship. And may we be people who are known for laying down our lives to worship God. That as we sit at his feet, we would listen and we would hear and obey what he says and that we would see him and that we would be like him. Would you bow your heads as we pray this morning? And as we do, there may be some of you in this room who would say, I've never entered into a relationship with God. I've never surrendered my life to Him. And if that's you this morning, I would just ask that you do it today, that you don't wait. And so if that's you and you would say, I'm in this room, but I've not surrendered my life to Christ, would you lift up your hand this morning? No one's looking around. Would you just lift up your hand to let me know? And there's another group of people in this room who would say, I, I've surrendered my life to God, but if I'm just honest, I don't surrender the daily moments. I don't live a life of worship. I don't live a life that is laid down at his feet. And I can do better. I wanna do better. And if that's you this morning, would you lift up your hands? So many across the room. And so God, this morning, For those in that first group that you said, I didn't surrender my life to the Lord, I've never done that. Would you just in your heart right now pray, God, I ask that you would come into my life. I surrender myself completely to you. I acknowledge that I'm dependent on you and that I need you. Come and take over every part of my life. And if you're in here this morning and you would say, I wanna do better at surrendering my life to the moments of worship. I wanna do better at sitting at his feet and being aware of his presence. Would you just right now take a moment and just do that? Just open your heart, open your mind and say, God, I'm here. God, I'm listening. And God, would you open my eyes to see the moments where I'm distracted by the many things when I should be doing the one thing. And God, I just ask that as a church, that we would be known as a people who worship you, God. That we would be known as a people, God, yes, that worship you with all we have when we're in this room together. But God, that we would also be known as people who worship you with all we have with the everyday moments of our lives, God. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.